Uh, just real quick, I want to thank Charles and the Foster Street community for allowing me to speak this morning. Uh, not only that, but I want to thank you guys for showing up. Uh, it's really nice having faces in the crowd that are very familiar and some faces in the crowd that aren't so familiar, um, just because it's nice. Uh, just a bit of a disclaimer, sometimes I will go lazy-eyed, and so if you see that, just ignore it like it's normal. And then also, like, sometimes my speech is really off, and so, like, my R's will turn, in, turn there it goes, turn into W's. And so it's really bad, but, you know, we'll get through this thing. Uh, but I've been looking forward to this opportunity ever since Charles presented me with the idea at the beginning of summer. Uh, ever since then, I've been preparing something, and God's laid this message on my heart, so I'm really looking forward to getting out to you guys. Uh, but like he just said, I just finished up my first year at SLU, have a year and a half yet left, and uh, I'm studying Christian ministry there, like he said, called the church plant as of right now, that's what it looks like. And uh, while I was there, I was able to preach one time, so this is my second time preaching, uh, but it was in front of about 20 to 25 college students, and it only lasted about 15 minutes. Um, and so if you look at this congregation I'm talking in front of now, it's quite a big difference. And so I have some nerves, but I got them out of the first service for the most part. So we'll see where this goes. Real quick, look to your neighbor and say, we're going to get through this together. Yeah, we are. All right. Well, this morning I want to open up talking about trust and faith. And first off, trust and more specific an example of trust. And that example being trust falls. And so if you don't know what a trust fall is, it usually involves two people. And so there's, there's me, and then there's somebody else, and they're standing about three or four feet away from you. And then whenever they're ready, you're going to give them an indicator word like fall. And they're going to fall backwards, and they're going to trust that you catch them before they hit the ground. Hence the term trust fall. If you've never done one, you should do it, but choose a friend wisely. It's a test. All right, and so that's trust. And a lot of people associate trust and faith as, as the, pretty much the same thing. But I'm here to tell you that there's a slight difference, and even though it's slight, it's pretty significant. And that is that trust is trust, but faith is a combination of both confidence and trust. So, so I use the equation like trust plus confidence equals faith. And I know it's kind of cheesy, but that's just how I remember it. And I believe faith comes around like after something's already been done for you. And so an example of a trust fall that is like low-level trust would be me falling into the arms of an elementary school age girl. Like, that's not going to go good. One, I'm going to hit the ground. Two, I'm going to hit her and she's going to hit the ground. Three, somebody's going to get hurt and hopefully it's not me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hopefully it would be me. But that's like a low level trust situation. And so a high level trust situation would be like me falling into the arms of a bodybuilder or me falling into the arms of like Lee Green. I don't know. Something along those lines. I think that's high trust. I don't know. We can find out after church. Um, but like I said, faith comes around after something's already been done. So trust and confidence equals faith. And so this elementary school age girl, she doesn't deserve my faith because she's not going to catch me. But the bodybuilder does because I fall into their arms and they catch me. First off, I trusted them. After they catch me, they gain my confidence that they can catch me again. And so, I have faith in the bodybuilder to catch me. And so, the younger girl represents anyone and anything that isn't Jesus. We don't deserve our faith, our actual faith. And the bodybuilder or laboring represents Jesus. I'm not trying to put Jesus on that level, but <laughs> Jesus deserves our faith. And Jesus doesn't just deserve our faith. Jesus deserves like our good, our best, our genuine, our better faith, the best faith we can possibly give Him. Jesus deserves that. And so I think we are called to become more Christ-like and to grow in relationship with Christ throughout our Christian relationship with God. I think we should definitely do that. And so if you look throughout the Bible, you see different areas of Scripture that talk about you know, what it looks like to have good faith, maybe some characteristics of good faith, how that looks and how it should be lived out. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. Some characteristics of good faith that we should all exemplify in order to, you know, that's how people outside these walls know you're a Christian without telling me you're a Christian, by having this good faith. And so I'm going to be coming to you out of James this morning, talking about good faith and characteristics. And we'll see what he has. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to James. I'll be in chapter 1, uh, chapter 2 toward the end. Uh, if you don't, you have your phone, you can do that. If not, we're going to have it on the screen. 
I have a lot of scripture throughout this sermon that's not going to be thrown up, so you just have to pay attention, and that was intentional. But first off, I want to talk about how our faith should be doubtless. We should have doubtless faith because why would we want to have faith with doubts? And we're told not to have doubtless faith. So James chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Now, have any of you ever been deep sea fishing? A few of you. Not all of you, but some of you. Well, for this illustration... Okay, all right. For this illustration, it don't matter. Uh, anything with motion sickness works. Um, but for one, I have been deep sea fishing before. And I'm bad at it. Every time I go, I get sick as a dog. And every time I go, it's not just I get sick. It's I get throwing up. Like, I throw up every time I go out. I've taken the pills, I've put the patches on, I've done both at the same time, and every single time I throw up. And usually it happens when the big fish is on. And so if you haven't ever been deep sea fishing, this is what happens when the big fish is on. Everybody has a role. So one, there's somebody reeling in the fish. Two, there's somebody coaching the person reeling the fish. I don't know why, but that's what happens. All right, there's somebody driving the boat trying to get closer to the fish, so this person's not having a reel so hard, and the fish is probably running away anyways. And then everybody else on the boat is trying to get the lines in so none of the lines get tangled up. And so while all this chaos is going on, I'm over there on the side of the boat throwing up. <laughs> like, it's bad, and I, and I hate it. And so if I hate being physically tossed around like a wave on the sea by the wind, why would I want my faith in God to be like that? Because if there's one relationship in this world that I want as stern as a rock, it would be my relationship with God. Amen. Exactly. Because because if my if my relationship with God is firm, then out of that relationship, other firm relationships grow. But it starts with God. And so I begin to wonder, like, like why we doubt? And I'm like, well, why do we doubt in the first place? And I believe it's because we we grew up in this age of technology and this society that we live in today, especially for you younger folk. But for you older folk, this this may this may resonate some. But we grow up in this age, and it's like. Like, if we don't see something, then we don't believe it. And none of us has physically seen Jesus. And so, like, an illustration of that would be like, I know I'm guilty of using this term. It's like, pics or it didn't happen. It's a phrase. And it's like, if you don't have pictures, that situation didn't actually happen. And so if somebody comes to me with, like, this skeptical story, like, oh, like, I seen this massive deer, I caught this big fish, or anything that's skeptical, I don't know. But if they come to me with that kind of stuff, and I'm like, you got a picture of it, like, I'd love to see this massive fish you caught. And they're like, no, I didn't think about it. And I'm just like, no, you didn't catch that fish. <laughs> you know, so we, we, like to, we like to see. And I think that's why, we, why sometimes doubt creeps into our mind is because we haven't actually seen. And I completely believe that that's why Romans 10, 17 was inspired to be written in Scripture. Because Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So we're called to believe without seeing. And, and so, you know, we read the stories and we hear about them on Sunday mornings. And, and a lot of us leave these walls and we don't read and we don't hear about them anymore. And so how do you expect to build a firm relationship with God if all you're getting out of it is a Sunday morning? Like, like it, it's outside of these walls where we build our firm relationship. And so some of, some of y'all's doubt may go all the way back to the resurrection. It's like, um, you know, maybe you doubt that Jesus ever came, that He was the Son of God, and that He actually came from, like, rose up after being dead. Maybe some of your doubt goes all the way back to that. And if that's the case, I encourage you to go read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because it goes into the resurrection pretty well. And I actually enjoy that chapter. But let's say you do, you do believe the resurrection. Like, the resurrection is like, Jesus came down, died for us, rose from the grave three days later. Like, I believe that. And then you're like, I believe that, but can you really move in my life today? And, and Scripture says that, that Jesus' power is the same today as it was yesterday, and so I have no reason to believe that whatever He did can't be done today. And so I believe, and I don't have doubt. But if you do have doubt, let me put this in your mind. And this isn't, this isn't my own like, thought. I got this from a worship singer or something like that, so I'm not going to take credit for it, but it is really good. So... God moves in our lives today like wind. Can you see wind? No. You cannot see wind. But do you believe wind is real? Yes. 
Because when you're standing outside and the wind hits you, your shirt moves or the leaves on the trees move or, or something, you can see the effects of wind, but you can't actually see it. But yet you still believe that it's a real thing. Wind is real. And so I think God moves in our lives real similar to that. You know, sometimes wind comes by and there's a breeze, and then sometimes wind comes by and it's a tornado. And so I think, I think the tornado points in our lives are like when we first become a Christian, like that converted. Or when we have like something tragic happen in our life. Or something great. Maybe you got a really good job and then God, God just storms into your life and you're like, oh my gosh, like God's the reason I got this job. And so like that's the tornado effect of like God's coming into your life, wrecking it, making you change your life, anything like that. But then also God comes in like a breeze. Because Scripture talks about how God's voice is the gentle whisper in all the noise. And so if there's a breeze blowing outside and you're inside, can you feel it? No. Now, if a tornado is outside and you're in your house, then you can still feel it. But if there's a breeze and you're inside your house, you cannot feel it. And so what I think about that is if there's a gentle whisper in the noise and you're not seeking it, you're not going to hear it. And so we have to be in the Word and we have to be praying. And I believe that there's no coincidence that in these verses it talks about wisdom. Because if you look at Proverbs 1, it talks about fear of the Lord being the beginning of knowledge. And I think wisdom is power. Because wisdom gives us the capacity to understand the world in light of God's word and purpose. And we all have a purpose in our lives ordained by God. We just have to seek it. And I believe that wisdom is the first thing that we should ask for as Christians growing in Christ. You know, after we come to meet Christ, after we get to know Him and we accept Him as our Savior, I think the first thing we should ask for is, God, give me wisdom. Why? Because wisdom gives us the understanding of God's Word and God's purpose. And then we're able to hear that gentle whisper because we know how to seek it. And we can hear Him speaking. And we can discern better. And so if you haven't seen God's effects in your life, I begin to wonder if you're asking in doubt. And so when you pray, are you praying like, God, I don't know if this can happen, or God, I don't know if that can happen, but I need it to happen. No. That's already doubting that God can make something happen. We have to, we have to pray in, in faith. We have to pray in faith. And so that, that should look something like, mm, I don't know, God, I need your will to be done in my life because I know that that's the best outcome possible. Because God's will in my life is the best outcome possible. We just have to be obedient. And so, lastly, I think we should have doubtless faith because where does doubtless faith lead us? The verse says that if you have doubtless faith, you're tossed on the waves by the wind and all that stuff. And so, if you've ever been on a boat, you don't have to be deep sea fishing, but if you've ever even been on a boat, like, if you're getting tossed around by the waves, like, you're not getting to your destination. Like, that's, that's not how it works. If you're being tossed around on the waves, you're going to end up in a shipwreck. And we don't want that with our relationship with God. So we got to form doubtless faith through the Word. Not only doubtless faith, but I believe our faith should be humble. Because the opposite of humble is like cocky in my eyes. And so why would we want to have cocky faith? We should. And so James 1, 9 through 10 says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. Hmm. That's tough. But real quick, I just want to say that, that being poor doesn't necessarily get you into heaven, just like being rich doesn't necessarily mean that you're not getting into heaven. But it's the act of relying and depending and having faith in God that gets you into heaven. Amen, church. And so, I think this verse just resonates because the poor like, have to rely on God. Like, without God, the poor probably have nothing because the God blesses the poor when they're not capable of blessing themselves. And so it's about acknowledging that blessing. It's about realizing that, yes, God's the one that gave me that blessing. And so, and so for whatever reason that they're poor, they acknowledge God. They acknowledge God that they depend on God and that their blessings come from Him. And so, I can't help but think, like, being relied on feels really good. And, and so, I'm not a mother or father or anything yet, but... Oh, I would never do that. I'm not a father. That's tough. That's tough. Okay, I'm not a father yet, 
but but I have been relied on in some like small situations. Um, some of you may consider them small. Some of you may consider them big. I don't know. But I can't help but maybe like as a father or mother, not me, but as you in the crowd, as a father or mother, like I can't help but think like it feels really good when your kids finally acknowledge all that you've done for them. Like hopefully this happens to you from all your kids at some point in your life. Hopefully it's before they move out because parents do so much. But it's like if when your kid comes to you and says, Mom or Dad, like, thank you so much for all you've done for me. Thank you for, for getting me all these places. Thank you for taking care of me in this way. I would not be in life where you I would not be where I'm at in life without you. And it's true. I think most of us could acknowledge that and we should acknowledge our parents and if you haven't you do it after church today. But but I can't help but think that God is the same way, but with everybody. You see, it's when we acknowledge God and we thank Him for the praises and the blessings that He's given us. And He really loves that, you know? Don't, I mean, you love it when your kids do it, so God has to love it when we do it because we are His children. And so I think we should acknowledge God and we should give Him the praise and the thanks for His blessings. And so for the rich, it doesn't, they don't have to necessarily rely on God. Because they, can, they sometimes get this mindset like, like, oh, I'm where I'm at today because I've worked hard and I've got this and my money's mine because I've worked this job and I made it. No, 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 no. You're getting, you're getting it wrong. And so what you should be thinking is like, okay, I rely on God because He's given me the characteristics that I have. He's built me the way I am as long as I'm looking to Him. He has blessed me with this job opportunity and opened that door for me when I didn't think it was possible. Like, like God's the one that put me where I'm at. And so, and so I think, I think like sometimes the rich tend to undermine God's work and like overmine their own work. And overmine isn't a word. Some of you definitely thought it was a word. But I, I'm pretty sure overmine's not a word. I'm going to use it here anyways. But like we tend to, some, the rich tend to sometimes overmine their own work, and that's not how you should live. See, how the rich should live is, is, is they should humble themselves with humble faith to serve others who can't give them anything in return and yet still thank God for giving them the means to do so. Right? And so, and so they're, they're called to be humble and to help. And even though they're not getting anything earthly, even though they're not getting any earthly reward, they're getting a the reward stored up in heaven. As long as they're not boasting about it. You know. So when we read James 4.10, it says, when we humble ourselves, then He exalts us. And this humble talks about like how we realize and acknowledge that, that we aren't worthy. Because we aren't. You see, we're definitely not worthy of the blessings that we receive today. Because God gave us the blessing of sending His Son down to die for us and saving us from our sins and creating, like, you know, He tore the veil and now we can enter into heaven just by having faith in Him. We don't have to slaughter all these lambs and all that stuff. We don't have to do that anymore because God sent His Son down to do that for us. And so that's the biggest blessing we can get, ask for. And yet He still blesses us today because He loves us so much. And so we have to realize and acknowledge that we are worthy. And then we humble ourselves. And that's when He lifts us up in heaven. And like I said, on our, on our path to, to Christ's likeness, we should want to follow in His example because we want to be like Christ. And so we want to humble ourselves and even Jesus was a humble person. You look at John 13, it talks about when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. And so back in that time, it was like you either went to like this middle or low income house and they would you know, provide the water and the towel and everything like that, but you would wash your own feet. It wasn't but when you went to like, like, a, like a rich person's house that they would have a slave wash your feet for you. So in this, in this circumstance, it was either like, like you're washing your own feet or you're getting your feet washed. You're never washing anybody else's feet unless you're a slave. And you see in John 13, Jesus puts himself in the position of slave and washes his disciples' feet. And then after that, he tells us that we should live by his example. So we should have humble faith. Proverbs 3.34 says, He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. And I know it's not good, but don't we kind of mock proud mockers too? Like when somebody's cocky, like when I think mockers, like the opposite of humble is cocky, I kind of get this vibe. And so, like, like we kind of don't like people who are cocky either. And so when we're around them for so long and they continuously act cocky, don't we get tired of it? 
It's like, and finally we call them out and we're like, dude, you're so cocky. And they're like, no, I'm just confident. And you're like, no, you're just something. Like, I don't know what it is with, with, with those people, but it's like, if you finally call them out on it, it's like, you're confident, I'm not cocky. And then they get defensive and then you're like, I, can't, I don't know what to say to this person anymore. And so if the, the opposite of cocky is humble, and we don't like cocky people, then why would we want our faith to be cocky? We should. We should want to serve and have humble faith. Because because we were put on this earth to serve and not to be served. Because you see, when we serve with the mindset of Christ, we're serving His people. When we serve with the mindset of Christ, that's when we humble ourselves. That's when we are humble. And that's when we're exalted in heaven by God because that's what we're going to be. Not only that, but we should be humble because we should view ourselves the way that God views us. And we're all on the same playing field. Because you see, God doesn't love you any more than He loves me, and God doesn't love me any more than He loves you. Amen. So why should I think that? Amen. I shouldn't think I'm above anybody because in God's eyes, we're all the same. Yeah. Even the people outside of this church, which some people may hear this morning. But everybody's the same in God's eyes. So we should have humble faith. Thirdly, I'd like to point out that our faith should be enduring. We should be able to endure through trials. We should be able to, to hold, hold strong to, to Jesus in our faith, even when we're under trial. Because if you look at James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. And so I looked this word up, persevere, in the Greek, because... I just took Greek class um, this last year at SWU, and it was really hard, but I made it through it. And praise God for Dr. Fitz because he taught me everything, and that was good. But like, but Greek's really hard, so just know that. But I made it through it. Um, only because God, glory to God. Um, but I looked at this word persevere, and it meant in the Greek to bear bravely and calmly. And I saw the bear bravely, and then it said, and calmly. And I was like, calmly? Like, are you going to ask me to, to be calm when I'm under trial? Like, I'm not just sitting there and being impatient like I'm under trial, and you're telling me to, to be calm. And so I made sure I looked up the word calm to make sure that me and, me and God were on the same platform right here. And it said, um, it said um, to not feel or show nervousness. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, like, being nervous is such an easy feeling to have. Like, I was nervous back then. I preached first service, and y'all all came in, and I was, like, ready to go. And then I got back there and sat down, and I was like, oh, my gosh, here they come. <laughs> but I'm good. I'm good. And it said, but, like, nerves is really hard. And then I got to thinking about it. I was like, God, you're telling me not to be nervous. Under trial. You're telling me not to be nervous under trial. And then I got to thinking about it. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why does that sound so impossible to us? Because it shouldn't. Because like I said earlier, if you believe that God's power is just as strong today as it was yesterday, then you should also believe that when Jesus was on earth, when He healed all those people of all those diseases, and He actually raised people from the dead, like there's no reason that I can't believe that He can do the same thing today. You see, you aren't just told to persevere in, in a time of waiting. No. Scripture says, persevere under trial. Because you see, there's a difference between like waiting in a waiting room for a checkup, and there's a difference between waiting in a waiting room for a surgeon to come out and tell you whether or not that person in surgery is going to make it. Like that's trial. A checkup is time and patience. Trial is surgery and death. Possibly. So we're called to be persevering in times of trial. And back in James' time, a time of trial could be anything between persecution and physical illness. So persecution would be like you died because you claimed to be a Christian and they would straight up kill you. And then it went all the way to physical illness. And that was like, you know, could be leprosy. And, and I'm not trying to undermine those things, but I, like I went through a trial of physical illness recently. And that was like, Y'all might laugh, but really, hold on, just, you know, I'll put yourself in my shoes and you'll see. So, like, I get headaches, like, once every maybe four or six months. Like, I seriously don't get headaches. I don't know why, but God has blessed me without having headaches, and it's great. So, I don't get them. And so, I was at camp this past summer, and, and I, I made it through high school camp, and I was good. And I went back to middle school camp the very next week, and I had a headache for five straight days. You're like, you're weak, and I'm like, no, I'm not. 
Okay, so this is what happened. I'm in a, I'm in a cabin with 20 middle school age boys, and I have a headache for five straight days. Somebody, like, somebody resonates with me out there. Or a teacher, somebody, somebody resonates with me out there. And so, like, but the thing was, like, it, it was worse for me because I don't get headaches. And so I got, like, I get them, like, twice a year. And so I had it for five days straight, and I was like, oh, my gosh. God, you're telling me to bear this bravely and calmly? Well, first off, it was kind of easy to be calm because the more I moved around and the more I got worked up, like, the worse the headache got. But then I realized I was like, no, 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 that's not it. Like, I'm not supposed to do it just because that's what my body's telling me to do. I'm supposed to do it because that's what God's telling me to do. And I should bear times of trial bravely and calmly. And so we bear those times. We bear those times of trial. We bear the times of waiting. And we flee from times of temptation. Because we all know that being tempted isn't a sin, but acting on the temptation is. Because all throughout Scripture, you see how Jesus was tempted, you know, 40 days of fasting and all that stuff. Hebrews 4, he was tempted, but he didn't act on himself by the sin. Jesus was sinless. And you see, on our path of, of transformation, hopefully to one day sanctification, I think we should want to be able to flee and persevere through the times of, of temptation as well. And you see, it's, it's when we spiritually endure that brings us reward. And it's actually specifically mentioned here in Scripture. If you didn't pay attention, it says, that person will receive the crown of life. That's what it says. And so, our spiritual endurance gives us the crown of life. And so, when we spiritually endure, when we're looking to God in all times and phases of our lives, when we're looking for him, to Him for our guidance, for our direction, for our protection, that's enduring times of trial. Receive the crown of life. And you see, if we read James 1 through 4, it says, By enduring, we may be made perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. That's hard to think about. Because I can I bet all of us can think about something that we need right now. <coughs> Probably most of them's going to be wants, but there are some needs out there. And so I don't care what it is. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what kind of job you have or what kind of shoes you wear. And I don't care how pretty you are. You're not going to receive this crown of life by having those worldly things. You've got to have from during faith. That's what Scripture says. And so our endurance also shows our love for Him. Because it says, Receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. And so, like, like God sent His only Son down to die for us, which is the greatest love I've ever heard of. And so if he's able to do that, why could we not show our love for him by enduring through times of trial? We should. And lastly, the last characteristic of faith that I want to talk about is being operative, acting out. Acting out with the Lord, not just, you know, not just by works, but have to have faith and works by your faith. And so if you read James 2.17, it says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. I'm just like, wow, it's a water. <coughs> and my voice was really glad to tell you um, But I got to thinking about that verse, and I'm like, wow, you're telling me that, that like, if I don't do things for the kingdom of God, like, my faith is dead? For real? Like, James, are you sure you got that right? And I'm sure he's got it right because literally nine verses later he says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So now I know and it's confirmed that faith without action is dead. If you're not being operative, you're dead. And then, and then some people have the nerve to throw Romans 3.28 at you, which says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And so it's like, so we aren't justified by works? Hold on, I'm getting mixed signals between Paul and James. And I'm like, right, we're not justified by our works, but by our faith. But if you have like good and genuine and better and best faith that you're trying to exhibit for God, works are going to be produced by your faith. Because you see, faith without deeds is not biblical faith. And so like, I begin to wonder like, if you're somebody out there and you have faith and you are... You are humble, you are doubtless, and you are enduring. You have all three of those attributes. Do you not think God would want to use you to build His kingdom? And in using you, that means you have to actually do things? Even though how some of us may not want to do things at all, but we're called to be doers of godly things. So if you look at Galatians 5, 6, it says, 
faith expressing itself through love. Love being the action here, and you're expressing love through faith. Your love is stemming from your faith. And sure, we can we can love people with our words. Hey man, I love you. Like you're doing so good. Like that sermon was so good. Hopefully I hear that after today, but I don't know, we'll see. Um, but like, you know, you can love people through words and you can encourage them. But we're called to do way more than that. We're called to do way more than that. Because if you look two verses before that, it says, Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food, those are needs. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? We aren't told just to tell people that we love them and to encourage them. Those things are great, and there's a market for that, not a market, but there's a place for that, and, and you should definitely tell people that you love them and you should encourage them through words. But if you're not physically helping people with their needs, then you're not doing what God has called you to do. And so, we aren't just called to serve each other. Like, like this side of the church isn't called to serve this side of the church and vice versa. No, the whole church is meant to serve each other and the people outside of the walls. Like, like, I don't care who these people outside of the walls are. I love them all. I don't care what religion they're in. I don't care what kind of income they're in. I don't care if they're Muslim, whatever it is. I don't care what gender they are. It doesn't matter. We're called to love all people. Because God doesn't serve favoritism, so why do we should it? We shouldn't serve favoritism. And so like again, if we want to follow in Jesus' example, we look to when he fed the 5,000. So when he done this, Jesus blessed and broke the bread, and then what did he do with it? He gave it to his disciples to distribute among the crowd. It doesn't say, the word doesn't say that Jesus distributed the, the food among the crowds. It says that he gave it to his disciples to distribute. Now, I wouldn't doubt it if Jesus helped them, but I know for a fact that he sent his disciples out to give them their food. And so, if God's going to do that with food and fish and bread, then why would he not do that with us, more efficient people? He wants us to. And so, there is no genuine, genuine faith in this world that does not have like this side effect of works. Because you know how you take some medicines and medicines have side effects like drowsiness or gas or something like that. I don't know. Side effects get crazy on some medications. I don't know. Side effects get crazy. Sometimes they probably do more harm than they do actually help. Because side effects. But um, but um, when we have good faith, I can't help but think like when we have a good dose of faith, like when we are prescribed faith, which we all should be, we all are prescribed. But when we have a good dose of faith. Like, it's not like a may cause side effect of, of works. It's like, if you have good faith, like, you're going to do works and there's nothing you can do about it because you believe in Jesus so much that you're going to want to do stuff Amen. for the kingdom. And so genuine faith requires the Spirit of God to live within us. And I, for one, believe that the Spirit of God moved back then when He was on earth, before He was on earth, when He was on earth. He's moving right now. And He'll move forever through the people who allow Him to move through it. That's exactly how it would be. And we all know that works without faith does not justify us. Our works come from our faith. But faith and works combined justify us before the Lord because it proves and it shows that our faith in Him is genuine, it's good, it's real, it's true, it's actual. We have to have work and faith. So if Ben can come on up, make your way slowly. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping this thing up uh, to be in a hurry. I'm going to look real quick at John 20, 31. It says... But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So God sent His Son down to die for us. Let me say that again, church. God sent His Son down to die for us. Like, like God sent His Son down to die for us knowing the sins that you have committed and knowing the sins that you are going to commit in the future. Like, that's amazing. He loves us. And not only that, but when his son got down here, when Jesus got down here, he willingly went to the cross knowing the sins that you have committed and knowing the sins that you were going to commit in the future. And yet he went to the cross anyways and died. Thank you, Jesus. God, that's love. That's love. You see, I'm done after this point, but like, like, we don't deserve that grace. We don't deserve it, but God gives it to us anyways because we have somebody in, in heaven that loves us so much like we can't even comprehend his love. Like, He does so much for us. He's constantly, like, blessing us and all this stuff. And, and we don't deserve it. And yet He does it anyways. And we may acknowledge Him, you know, like, 
Some of us may acknowledge Him once a year. Some of us may acknowledge Him every day. I hope you are. But if not, like He's going to bless you anyways. Like it's crazy. And and not only did His Son down, like not only did He send His Son down and die for you, but I know for a fact that throughout your life you've never been alone. God deserves your faith. Like even though you may have felt alone in a situation, I can promise you that God was there. He was never away from you. You just weren't looking in the right spot. God deserves your faith. And I don't think we should penalize God by like revoking our faith because we weren't looking in the right areas. Because you see, when you were in that valley, God was right here, but you were looking over there. God was right here in that valley, and you were looking over that way. And yet you penalize God because you try to rely on your own strength to get out of that hole. And when you do that, you're actually digging yourself deeper, and then you get down there. And you're like, like... God, why have you forsaken me? Like, you're not near me and all this time. He's right here. And then you look dumb. Because then you finally start forsaking Him. And then He brings you out. And you realize it was Him. And so now you've got to seek Him in all situations. Because you see, I've been the one down in that valley before. And I've been the one that like went through this phase about, about a phase of doubt. And, and you see, like, I didn't really grow up in the church, but had always heard about God and, and how, like, God was real. I went to VBS some, like, had some people pour into my life at a young age. And so, like, I didn't, I didn't, like, I wasn't really a regular church goer, but, like, I believed in God and, like, God was real, honestly. And so I went through this, this period. It was about, it was probably like five years ago, I don't know. And it was an extended period of, of doubt. Like, I did not think all this was real. I was like, there's no way. Like, if I can't see Jesus, I'm not going to believe in Him because what kind of hoopla is that? <coughs> and so I went through this phase of doubt. It was a long time. And, like, I tried relying on my own strength to get me out of that situation. And eventually I got out of that situation. But looking back, it wasn't my own strength that brought me out. It was the grace of God that brought me out. And so now that I know that He's brought me out of that situation, I know He can bring me out of any situation. Like, it doesn't matter if I go back down in that same valley or if I go in a different valley, I know that God's down there with me. Because the demons are down there, because, because the enemy's down there, and the Scripture says that, that God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Thank God. And so while we're down there in that valley, and we're preaching, and uh, we're, um, we're, being, we're, we're having a table prepared for us by our Father while He's fighting our battles. And so while I'm down there eating, God's fighting my battles. And who, who better to fight my battles for me than God? Because where I'm weak, God makes me strong. And where I'm strong, God's stronger. And so I want Him to fight my battles. And so I'm down there eating. He's fighting my battles. And not only am I eating, but I'm capable of learning in that situation. You see, I'm down there. God brings me out. And I learn through that situation. And when that happens, I can look back and somebody else is down in that same battle and I can help them out. I can encourage them. I can meet a need that they need. I can tell them about God if that's what they want to hear. Hopefully it is. Hopefully I can point them in the direction of God for that so they can seek Him for Himself. Because God's with us always. We just got to realize it. So I'm here today to tell you that it doesn't matter where you have been or where you currently are. It doesn't matter whether you're in a valley or if you're on a peak. It doesn't matter if you're struggling or you're succeeding. It doesn't matter whether you feel worthless or you feel worthy. It doesn't matter if you're at a standstill with God or you're moving forward with Christ. He's always with you and God deserves your faith. Amen. Because you see, we've got a God that gives good grace. So let's place our faith, let's place our lives, and let's surrender our wills over to His hands. And our good faith, our humble, our operative, our enduring, and our doubtless faith in His hands. Amen, Jay. <laughs>